growing up, you believe in democracy, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we currently have a federal government that does not. Um, I'll elaborate on that in a minute, but I'm absolutely thrilled that I have with me here Craig Scott, our Democratic Reform Critic. He's flown in from Toronto to speak to you. And Ray Cash Walters, who's seeking the NDP nomination in Edmonton Centre. So, what is going to stop this bill is you. We're doing our best in the House of Commons to be raising this issue. But if you follow the way that the current strong majority conservative government is running their affairs, they don't care what we think as the official opposition, and they don't care what you think. What's the proof of that? They're fast-tracking this extremely regressive law through the House of Commons. And they've done this to 91 bills so far. This is just another example. Now, we actually had to filibuster in committee to have more than just one or two days on this bill. Now, you're concerned about this bill, pretty evident from uh, your billboards you have here, but there's a whole bunch of other people in this country who are equally concerned, and they'd be hardly called left-wing radicals. For example, retired Supreme Court of Canada justices, the Federal Privacy Commissioner appointed by the Harper government, Constitutional experts are raising very serious issues about this bill. So, four former prime ministers, four former prime ministers. I'm not going to go into the detail of the issues under this bill because we have one of the constitutional law experts of Canada here. Uh, before Craig was elected, he taught constitutional law and the Charter of Rights at University of Toronto. So I'm absolutely thrilled that he's here with me today. What we're, we are just as deeply concerned about the way that the government is fast-tracking this bill through, which is going to have extremely aggressive impacts on your rights as ordinary Canadians. Don't be fooled into thinking that this bill is simply targeting quote-unquote terrorists. Anybody who is informed and knows how to review legislation knows that this bill is going far beyond that. It's going to be putting anybody who stands up like this in a demonstration at risk of being designated a terrorist and at risk of being investigated. And I just want to give you one example of where this kind of behavior has occurred in Canada before. Um, I was working with a group of people and farmers who were concerned about this big high-powered power line going through our farmland from the Wabam area to Calgary. And what did we discover? That the uh, utility authority had hired spies to spy on us and sit in our conference calls. It became such a scandal, they had to shut down the whole utility board. This is the kind of thing that you can expect at the federal level if this bill goes through. It's not simply they're going to be targeting our First Nations who try to demonstrate against uh, industrial development that happens on their lands that is inappropriate when they don't have a voice. It's not just about so-called a, a, a terrorist extremist. It's going to impact you and your right to express your views. So I'm going to turn over to my my colleague Craig and I'll let you speak to the content of this bill. It's amazing to see so many people uh, out for this and you're not alone. Uh, I understand that we're, we're looking at something like uh, 50 cities across the country with groups of people as concerned and as engaged as you are. Um, I've just come out of uh, committee on Thursday night where I was asked to come in and do some questioning because of my background in national security law, constitutional law. Um, you can't hear? Can you hear now? Even louder? <laughs> okay, can you hear now? All right. I've just, I've just come out of a committee Thursday night where C-51 was being uh, looked at in the third of its hearings. And I have to say that I came out of there ashamed of being an MP, not for what the NDP and uh, the Greens actually are doing to try to oppose the bill, but by the fact that I have to sit across from Conservatives who use their question with respect to the first Muslim Canadian witness at the committee to leave innuendo for three or four minutes of innuendo that somehow this person was coming to justify terrorism. It was one of the... It was one of the most disgusting moments I've experienced in my three years as a member of Parliament. And all I can say is that Mr. Uh, Gardi, Isan Gardi, who's the head of the National Council for Canadian Muslims, the way in which he handled that with aplomb, with calm, 
and with dignity is something that I, I honestly can't say that I would have done the same in return. Um, this is an awful... This bill truly is a threat, not just to constitutional rights, not just to the rule of law, but also to our, our very democracy, because we have to remember that this bill, although called in the short title the Anti-Terrorism Act, it's a massive deepening and expansion of the spy state or the surveillance state or the secret state. Now whatever justifications there are for expanding national security law, none of them have been put on the table by this government as the reasons for going well beyond any focus on terrorism and even then when they're focusing on what they think is terrorism they're doing it in ways that are completely unjustified there are reasons that we really 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 should be concerned if not afraid of what could come out after this bill gets rammed through the house of commons unless unless we're successful in the way we were with the Unfair Elections Act, C-23. And that is to so force the government back on their heels, they're already not expecting the massive outpouring of resistance across this country. To actually force through five or six major amendments that will at least get us through to the, after the next election when hopefully the entire bill can be repealed and stitched back together in a way that makes sense both for security and all the values we hold dear. Now let me just tell you one or two quick things about the bill because frankly, the list is so long. Two of my colleagues, Ms. Uh, Professors Forsese from Ottawa, University of Ottawa, and Roach from University of Toronto, have written in a kind of guerrilla style over the last month, over 200 pages of close analysis of this bill. They are single-handedly most responsible for the awareness of the media and us as politicians of what is in this bill. They all deserve, frankly, the Order of Canada for their work in the last six, six weeks. What they have detailed, I can only touch the surface on. But here are a few things. There's a new act plonked into this bill. It's called the uh, long title, there's a long title, but the short title is the Information Sharing Act. First thing, as Linda said, the information that can be shared across 17 different government agencies uh, it includes a huge, long, open-ended list. It can be added to by the cabinet at will, where terrorism is only not one in the list. Okay, one in the list of eight areas in which information can be shared. They have not included in that sharing circle the review bodies of any of the security agencies except for the commissioner for a CSEC, which is the Canada Security Establishment. The oversight body that is partial oversight body for the RCMP is not in the loop. And CERC, the oversight body for CSIS, is not in the loop. And the main uh, bottom line recommendation about the Arar commissions and the Air India inquiries were that if you're going to have information flow in order to prevent terrorism, you also have to prevent stovepiping and make sure information can flow to the oversight bodies so they know what's going on across jurisdictions. So the, the commissioner for uh, the CSEC commissioner, the commissioner for security, uh, 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 security establishment of Canada, has just written a letter as well. He probably won't get to testify, just like the privacy commissioner, who's an officer of parliament, is not being allowed to testify, saying, I, he says, I don't understand why you would so expansively create information sharing out into this kind of total awareness state and not include the review bodies. What's the answer? It's deliberate. It's absolutely deliberate. This government does not want oversight or review of any kind. Now, in that Information Sharing Act, there's a provision that says any recipient, that is any of the 17 listed entities, can share the information they receive, and this is a direct quote, with any person for any purpose, okay? Any person for any purpose. That includes foreign agencies, it includes uh, anybody outside of Canada. This is what uh, Professors Roach and Forsese call the anti-Maher Arar Clause. It basically is a, I shouldn't do this on camera, <laughs> pretend there's one finger going up. It's basically giving the finger to the Arar Commission and everything we know about what happened to him, what happened to Mr. Almaty, Mr. Al Malki, Mr. Nuruddin. Then they have the nerve to add a provision that says, and by the way, if information is shared in good faith, 
There is immunity from any civil lawsuit. So the lawsuit that Mr. Maher successfully brought, there was a settlement against the Canadian government for sharing information with the Americans and the Syrians that led to his rendition and then his torture. Almost certainly, it was stupid, it was incompetent, it was callous, but it was probably in good faith. That, that lawsuit would now no longer be possible, nor would the lawsuits now being brought by the three other gentlemen I named. Another thing they allow is, again, well beyond anything that supposedly relates to terrorism, is a new activity for CSIS in Canada and abroad that we call disruption. They're calling it an understated way measures in the bill. But basically, as long as it's determined by CSIS that something is reasonable and proportionate in order to somehow prevent or get in the way of or disrupt activity, including on anything within CSIS's mandate, CSIS's mandate goes well beyond anything to do with terrorism, then they can do it. If they think that it requires them to break the law or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, then and only then do they have to go to a judge. But they have to go to a judge and say, can you sign off in advance on violating the Constitution or breaching the law? It's the, it's the most ludicrous standing on its head of any proper understanding of the role of rights in a, in a constitutional democracy or the appropriate role of judges. If you're going to ask judges to look at what's reasonable and appropriate, you set out what the measures are in legislation. You have the executive decide whether they're uh, uh, required or necessary in a certain circumstance. And then the judiciary uh, later can figure out whether or not that was justified or you have some other oversight mechanism. You don't turn the judges into agents of the spy state, including in, in, secret, in secret proceedings. The proceedings will be secret. And then after the fact, there is no follow-up. There's nothing written in to say the judge has to be told what happened to make sure it wasn't abused, etc. Now, there's an absolute limit on what can be done. You cannot intentionally or by criminal negligence kill or bodily harm somebody. That's nice to know. <laughs> you can't um, uh, impact on somebody's sexual integrity. I assume that probably has something to do with the spy world's use of honey traps and things. I'm not sure. And the third thing is you can't willfully engage in obstruction of justice. Everything else by way of rights that could be in infringed under the charter is, are on the table. And it, including the fact, and here, bodily harm and death does not include kidnapping or detention or the, the forcible sending of somebody somewhere else. CSIS now has powers around the globe, not just for investigation in C-44, which already is, is passing, but in C-51 to engage in these disruption measures. When we've asked in committee, all the experts say det detention is left open by this language. And then they say, why wouldn't the government specify that it's not allowed? So when yesterday in the House of Commons, when one of our members, a critic for public security, Randall Garrison, who's been doing an amazing job, stood up and said, is or is not detention included as one of the possible disruption measures in that broad language, they simply refused to answer. The easiest answer, if it's not, is to say, no, of course. Why are you so paranoid? No, they don't say that. It's proof that they want it in play. Now, the last thing I would say, Frankly, there's so much else in this bill, but one of the things that has been um, deepened in this bill is preventative detention, which means it used to be that if uh, there's a likelihood that somebody will commit a, an offense even, we always have had peace bonds that would allow that, you can be um, on a warrant or in exigent circumstances you can be detained in order to prevent that, and then a judge can issue conditions for you staying free because you're a threat to somebody usually. It's a, usually a personal um, injury or death threat uh, situation. So now under this bill, it's only you can be hauled before a judge and conditions imposed. If you, don't, if you breach those conditions, you go to jail and you can be hauled before a judge for seven days, uh, not before a judge, but in detention for seven days before the judge has to decide anything on the basis of the fact that somebody has judged that you may commit a terrorist offense. Now, one of the provisions in this bill is to say that anybody who somehow or other encourages or promotes terrorist 
offenses in general. Nobody knows what that would mean or look like. Um, in a way that could reckless lead to rec be reckless as to whether or not somebody might then actually commit some offense, then you yourself are a terrorist. Now the breathtaking breadth of this in terms of what it could be used for, I had an insight into that Thursday night because essentially what Diana Blonsky, the Conservative MP, was doing in that committee meeting when she was questioning the representative of the National Council of Canadian Muslims was, was saying that in the course of your work, when you're talking, taking issues on this organization or that organization, be careful because otherwise we're calling you a terrorist now, but under this bill, you will become a terrorist. All right? That's effectively what the subtext of that was. So you put the two together, that you recklessly, uh, you uh, say something or do something that uh, is reckless as to whether somebody else may commit a terrorist offense, and then you put that together with the fact that you may be preventatively detained if you may commit an offense, and then the threshold for actually pulling people in in a preventative detention sweep or regime or threatening people with it in order to achieve other ends, the sky is the limit. So basically, we, this is a, a, I was about to say regime, and I will say, this is a regime that cannot be trusted. Quite apart from what the analysis reveals about the dangers in the bill, the fact of the government that is pushing it through, the way they're push, pushing it through, and the way they're refusing to say that some of the worst implications are not in the bill, we have reason to be concerned for the future of our democracy. So thank you all so very, very much for taking the time. Please stay with us. It's going to be your voices that will make the